Hello class. Uh, today we're going to talk about pesticides in the home garden. And this is a topic I know that makes a lot of people nervous. However, it's an important topic. Uh, there are a lot of homemade herbicides and pesticides that I see circulating on the internet. Um, you can choose from a whole wealth of products at the garden center. And if you're gardening, chances are you're going to encounter some sort of pest or disease that you're going to have to control in some way. So today we're going to talk about the different types. And we're going to talk a lot about how to do safe application of pesticides in your home garden and to do it with confidence. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions around pesticide use, and hopefully we can ease some of those fears here. So what is a pesticide? Any material that's applied to kill, attract, repel, or regulate pests would be considered a pesticide. A good thing to think about is that, you know, the flea control or the heartworm medication that you give to your pets is technically a pesticide. And a pest is any animal or plant that's detrimental to humans or human concerns. So in your garden, that might mean the things that are munching on your vegetables that make them not fit to eat for yourself. So pests do occur in all gardens, and managing them is a big part of gardening. The suffix side, C-I-D-E, is something that refers to a person or a substance that kills. So anytime you see that, you know it's intended to kill something. In agriculture, they're called pesticides, but in human healthcare, these products are called medicine. So keep that in mind as we move forward. There's a lot of different types of pesticides and classifications of them. Uh, I think some common ones that we see in home gardens would be herbicides, which kill plants. It's got the prefix herb, herb refers to plants, and that's typically used as a weed control product in our gardens. Insecticides kill insects, and a good human medicine analog would be products that kill head lice. You know, that would be a medicine versus a pesticide. Fungicides target fungi. Um, in a human health standpoint, that would be ringworm or athlete's foot. In plants, that might be powdery mildew or any of the fungal pathogens that we see commonly. Um, miticides or arachicides kill mites and ticks. Um, in humans, we sometimes get chiggers in our legs um, in the south, so that's a mite or an arachicide application. Nematodes, um, nematicides <laughs> kill nematodes. Um, heartworms in your dog are actually the same thing. They're a nematode or a worm, and they would use that kind of a product. Molluscicides kill mollusks, so snails and slugs in your garden. Um, here in South Louisiana, we have an invasive species called apple snail. That's something that we would use those products on. Rodenticides kill rodents, so mice and rats. Um, if you get them in your house, you put out little bait stations. That's something you might encounter in your garden as well. And a bactericide kills bacteria. So that's something like in a home setting, like a disinfectant for your countertop that you would use. Pesticides vary by selectivity also. Non-selective pesticides kill all related pests. Non-selective herbicides kill all plants that get a sufficient dose of that product. Whereas selective pesticides kill only certain target weeds, insects, or plant pathogens. They're very specific. So you can spray them over the top and they will only kill the pests that you target and not any of the other things in the area. Um, for example, some selective herbicides only kill broadleaf weeds, so you can use them in a lawn and they won't kill your grass. Um, that's a pretty common one we use here in New Orleans. Pesticides also vary by the type of control. Uh, that's how they work and encounter and interact with the pest. Systemic pesticides are absorbed through plant tissues and transported throughout the entire plant. So you spray them or you drench the soil, they're taken up by the roots, and that product's able to move throughout the entire plant. Contacted pesticides are not absorbed by the plant, and they have to have direct contact with what you're trying to control. Um, you would typically have to spray it on that pest or spray it in a way that the pest is going to pick it up later. So that's a contact pesticide. Pesticides also vary by persistence, um, how, or how long they remain active in the environment. Residual pesticides remain active for weeks or longer. A uh, common one in our gardens would be preen or any kind of pre-emergent herbicide that we might use in flower beds. Non-residual pesticides are inactivated immediately or within a few days. Um, some products will break down when they encounter sunlight or when they 
are out in the environment, the UV light kind of breaks it down. Microorganisms can also break down a lot of pesticides. Okay, so Anna has talked to you about what a pesticide is. Now we're going to talk about like why you ne don't necessarily need to use a pesticide. We're going to cover other options before we even get into the, the rest of the pesticide lesson. So one of the things that we throw around in the industry a lot is the concept of IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management. So if you look at this, there's a nice long definition. I'm going to work you through it. So the an IPM system is an eco-based system. It's a strategy that's focused on a long-term prevention of pests and their damage. So what we're looking at is not just one plant. We're looking at an overall garden. We're looking at the whole picture. We're going to try to mix things up and make sure that we have the whole system taken care of and not just that one plant that we're thinking about. We're going to do this through a combination of techniques such as biological control, habitat manipulation, cultural practices, pesticides, and the use of resistant varieties. So there's a whole lot of things that go into this. You know, usually just going out and spraying a crop with some insecticide isn't always your best bet. Usually it is not. In fact, it could do you more harm than you do good. So if you don't take that whole approach. Pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risk to human health, beneficial, and non-target organisms in the environment. So remember this, we're, when we're applying pesticides, it's, we have to be really, take care, we have to take care to make sure that we're not harming ourselves, we're not harming the environment, and that we're actually trying to protect the beneficial organisms that are in our gardens. If we, like I said, if we end up spraying a pesticide and we kill the beneficial organisms that are there, that are trying to help us, all we'll do is take away the pressure and the pest organisms just multiply even better. Uh, a great example is the vegetable garden here in New Orleans City Park versus the one we have, say, out in Metairie. Out in Metairie, there's, it's a beautiful area, it's a, it's a park setting, but there are not a whole lot of other plants in the area. There's trees and then there's our luscious little garden. There's not a place, any places for these beneficial organisms to hide. Whereas here in the botanical garden, there are lots of other plants. They're actually, you know, helping the beneficial organisms. We have far fewer pest pressures here in this garden than we do in the other garden. So some of the concepts of integrative pest management is that you anticipate and prevent the damage. So you actually need to know beforehand what to expect. Now, if you're growing a tomato, the best thing to do is look at our tomato growing guide. It, in, it's going to tell you exactly what pests and diseases to expect. So you should already have that in mind. So as soon as you see any signs of these things, you'll know what you're dealing with. It uses several tactics in combination. So again, it's not just one approach. It's many things that we're trying to do. It does improve the effectiveness and it reduces the side effects. So you're going to have better crops and you're going to have fewer uh, mal effects coming from it, it, these uses. And it relies on the identification, measurement, and assessment, and knowledge. Again, when I mentioned the garden earlier about where you would put your garden, and I mentioned how it needs to be accessible at least once a day, if this is part of the thing I'm talking about. You need to go out there, and as soon as you see the first pest, you need to take actions at that point, or at least decide if actions are even necessary. So identify the insect that you're dealing with, or the disease, or whatever it is that's causing your plants to have problems, and then take care of it. You'll see that it's not always just a pest. There's many reasons that your plants could be having problems. Um, the idea is essentially, when all else fails, then consider use of a pesticide. There's lots of steps in between before we get to that. Again, like I said, identification of the pest is essential. Always identify the pest or the problem before taking any action. Because I spoke to a person recently, and he told me that he was going out and applying lime to his yard because he was having a problem with his lawn. But he never identified what was the problem with his lawn. He never got a pH test, so he has no idea what the pH is. So for all we know, he's going completely in the opposite direction of what he should be doing. And this happens all the time. People think they have 
a pest problem, when they have a disease problem, or something like that, and they just go completely in the wrong direction, and they waste their time. Misidentification results in errors in knowledge, errors in identification, and ineffective control of the real problem. Again, like I said, if you don't identify it, you're just taking shots in the dark. There are biotic and abiotic symptoms and conditions with plants. There could be the pH is too high. There could be a pest feeding on the plant. It could be a disease planting, uh, uh, feeding on the plant. You could have a nutrient deficiency we'll talk about in a minute. But there's all kinds of things that could be causing your plants to have problems. And again, if you don't know what it is, you're just taking a blind aim to see how to control it. Misidentification also results in lost time and wasted money. If you're buying a fungicide when you should be applying a pesticide, that's all wasted money. <clears throat> After identifying the pest, you can consider all your options before taking actions. If you look at every one of our publications, usually the use of pesticides is the very last thing that we suggest. And before that, there's two or three chapters or talking about cultural practices and other controls that you can use. One of the first things you can do is biological control. This is uh, the fact that you're going to be introducing predators or use of antagonistic organisms. Now, you don't always have to necessarily introduce these insects or um, predatory predators. Sometimes it's just a matter of providing them with the, the right environment they need to succeed. So again, like I said, by having other kinds of plants in your garden, for having conditions where these uh, beneficial organisms can live, they will be ready to take out the pests when needed. You know, could, these could be birds, these could be predatory insects, these could be lizards, things like this. All are going to be helping in your garden to keep that pest population down. Mechanical control is really good, especially if you're out there in your garden and you're out there every day. If you see one bug, you see two bugs, take them off. You can wear your gloves, just have a cup there with some soapy water in it, just drop them straight in. Sometimes some bugs, if you just shake the plant and they fall off, sometimes they have a hard time getting back on the plant. So there's lots of different things. Mechanical uh, is a good way to stop or control pests and keep them down. Cultural practices. Stop, one example is um, stop overhead watering, use drip irrigation that will reduce uh, the disease pressure, things, uh, things like that. Physical, you can cover your plants with netting, things like that. There are lots of different options for that. If you keep the insects out, they can never lay their egg on there, which will develop into a caterpillar, which will eat the plant. So there's plenty of ways you do that. I usually cover my strawberry plants with a little cage that I made to keep the birds out. That worked really well. There's genetic changes you can make. You can actually, Anna mentioned this the other day when she was talking about seed selection. When you're collecting seeds, and this has been done by horticulturists down through the ages, they would select plants that, were, that did better. They would choose the ones that, that had the, uh, the traits that they wanted, the ones that were less fed on by insects and things like that. And those are the ones that they produced as plants for the next year. And throughout the, se um, throughout the centuries, we've come up with pest-resistant varieties of some of these uh, vegetables and plants that we can use. Then there's chemical control. And that's the use of appropriate pesticides according to the label directions. And this could be something you know, as inert as horticultural spray oil or insecticidal soap. These are all still pesticides, and they need to be used according to the label direction, the label rates, read the entire label before you use them. Now, if you are deciding to use some pesticides, make sure that before you do purchase your pesticides, that you do identify the pest. Again, number one thing, you always have to make sure you know what you're dealing with. You want to read the pesticide labels of your available options. You want to know what products you have available, how they're applied, how the situation will fit with your situation. Um, some of these products, you might see that there's, you know, you're going to apply it to one plant, but that plant is sensitive to this product or something like that. So you want to make sure you pick the one that will work with you. And then choose that best product that works. Be sure to have the proper equipment for the application. Again, this is something you're going to decide as you're reading that label. There's lots of different formulations that I'll cover, and you want to make sure you have the equipment to be able to apply it. And then be sure to have the per proper personal protective equipment. 
So on the label, it'll, also, it'll tell you what kind of equipment you need to wear to keep safe and make sure that you have that on hand before you go out to apply. Let's talk a little bit about how pesticides are labeled. Every pesticide does come with a label, and the label is actually a legal document. The label is the law. We're gonna say that a few times in this lecture, but the label is the law, and everything on that label must be followed just so. The main method of communication between the pesticide manufacturer and the pesticide user is the label. It is unique to every single pesticide, and it's overseen and regulated by the EPA. The EPA requires documentation for claims of effectiveness, safety, environmental effects, and essentially everything on the label that is required information before that product can go to market. Every label has legally required information on it. Again, the label is the law. Here's a few things that the label must contain. The label has to have the name, address of the producer, the registrant, or the person for whom that is produced, a restricted use statement if required, the product name, brand, or trademark, an ingredient statement, a signal word, now this is important, including a skull and crossbones if either are, import, or are required. So that signal word may be danger, caution, something to that effect. Keep out of reach of children, if that's something that applies to that specific product. Any precautionary statements, including hazards to humans, domestic animals, or the environment. The EPA registration number, every pesticide has this. And the EPA establishment number, that's where it's produced. That way, there's a traceability process if something goes wrong. Storage and disposal statements, so what to do with that container when you use everything up and how to safely store it in your home. A referral statement to the directions and use of booklet. And the net weight or measure of the contents of that package. When should you read the label? Well, before buying a pesticide. We all go to the garden center and there's a wealth of choices there. Um, you know, if you've identified your pests, you've done a little research and you know, okay, I need to go buy this. You should be in that pesticide aisle at the garden center or, you know, the nursery, wherever you shop, and read that label before you make the purchase. You should also reread that label before mixing and applying the product, just to familiarize yourself with how to do that properly. All of that information is on the label. You should also refer to the label when you're storing your pesticides. Certain things are flammable at high temperatures. Other things become ineffective at very low temperatures. Um, all of that information is going to be on the label. This can save you time and money. That product won't go bad if it's stored properly. And there's a safety concern there too, because you don't want something to spontaneously combust in your tool shed, so read that label. You should also read the label before disposing of any unused pesticide or an empty container. Um, one of the best ways to use pesticide is to just spray it out in the environment properly, following the labeled instructions. Um, a lot of municipalities and parishes or counties will support a pesticide cleanup or collection day. That's something you can check with your local government about. Typically, it's twice a year. Um, but even just the empty container, if you think about the empty pesticide container, it's got residue on the inside, and you don't want to reuse that container for anything else. So there will be instructions for disposing of that container properly on the label. We're going to say this again. The label is the law. <laughs> it is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. That is on the pesticide label for every single product. So keep that in mind that if you go off label, you are breaking federal law. There's two different things to think about here. Restricted use pesticides versus general use pesticides. Um, restricted use pesticides are typically not going to be used in a home garden so much, but they would be used by a contractor or a professional that you might hire. So it's important to know the difference. Restricted use pesticides have the potential to cause unreasonable adverse effects to the environment and injury to applicators or bystanders without added restrictions. The restricted use classification restricts a product or its uses to a certified applicator, that would be someone you would hire, or someone under the certified applicator's direct supervision per the EPA. 
So this is a licensing process that happens in every state. I have this license, but I had to go through some training and a testing procedure to get that license. Um, without that license, as a homeowner, you are unable to get and apply these restricted use pesticides legally. But you could contract or hire somebody to apply those products. General use pesticides are sort of the over-the-counter, off-the-shelf pesticides that you as a home gardener can have access to. Those are available to home gardeners without a license, and that's what you'd find at the garden centers. Concentrated versus ready-to-use products, this is also something to consider. Typically, concentrated products um, must be diluted prior to use, so they must be mixed in a spray tank. Um, concentrated pesticides usually require a higher level of precaution. You think about it, the active ingredient is hyper-concentrated, so if you get a little on you or accidentally spill, there's going to be a lot more of that active ingredient in that situation. Um, Ready-to-use products have already been diluted. They're ready to go, typically by the manufacturer, at the appropriate application concentration. Um, further dilution at that point might make them ineffective, so it's not a good idea to add a little bit of water to make them last longer. They usually also have a built-in spray mechanism. I'm sure we've all seen this where you go to the garden center and there's a little spray bottle. It's got the pesticide in it and it's ready to go. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some tips about using pesticides. As Anna said, when you are dealing with a pesticide, make sure you do read the label. The label is the law. Besides it being just a requirement that you do this, there's actually a lot of good information on that label that you're going to need to know. All kinds of information about how to use their product safely and effectively. So one of the things you're going to do when you're dealing with pesticides is you want to use the correct application equipment. Make sure you read the label. It's going to tell you exactly what kind of equipment that you want to use. If it's a ready-to-use product, like she said, it already probably comes in its own um, applicator, so you don't need to worry about that. Although you do need to make sure you know what you're doing with that as well. Um, if you need to use a hand pump sprayer or even a larger uh, spray rig, then that's, you're going to have to make sure you get the right product, the right equipment, before you go start using this. Check out the equipment before filling it with pesticides. Make sure that your pump actually works. Fill it with a little water. Test it out. Make sure the seals are good. Make sure that it uh, just doesn't. Um, make sure that it holds pressure. Make sure that it, the hose is not filled with spider webs or something from the year before. Very often, the tip will get uh, clogged with some uh, some of the product you used. So make sure your equipment is in good working order before you put the pesticide in. You really don't want to be mix, uh, messing around with that, that, that solution once it's mixed. Make sure you are using the appropriate personal protective equipment. This includes basically all the times that you're handling this product. Even when they're closed, I like to have my gloves on because there could be some of this product, just even from shipping, on the outside of this uh, container. So I want to make sure that I'm protected. And like Anna said, when you're dealing with the concentrate, that's exactly what that is. It's a concentrated solution, so it's actually more dangerous than the final solution. So when you're dealing with that concentrate and you're mixing it, you want to make sure you have your gloves and your goggles on, water, at least make sure that if there's other uh, PPE required, make sure you have that and are wearing it. Use the correct amount of pesticide. You know, when it comes to pesticide use, homeowners are notoriously the biggest problem with pesticides and the application. You know, professionals don't mix dangerous levels of pesticides. They don't go around uh, over-mixing because that's money wasted to them. They also know that more is not always better. All of these products have been tested thoroughly. They know exactly what concentrations work they know how to use them, and they know what they'll do. If you go around mucking around and you think if more is better, that's not right. Always follow the directions. The label is the law. Anything outside of that, you could be liable if something goes wrong. You can, you can use less than what the label says, but you can never use more. But really, it's not a good idea to use less because, like I said, it's been tested. They know how much to use. By using less, you could be causing more problems because you might not kill all the population and then you'll just leave uh, another like insects behind that may develop resistance to this pesticide. 
things happen bad when you use the wrong amount of chemical. And also know the re-entry period, the re-entry interval, REI is what you might see on the, say on the level, and also the, uh, the pre-harvest interval. So after you apply a product, uh, a lot of times say herbicide on the lawn. The re-entry interval will just say, wait till it dries. That's it. So make sure you know what the wording is. Sometimes it could be one, two, or three days or more. So if you go out in the field, you don't want to be exposed to that. And the pre-harvest interval is how long after I apply this product will it be safe for me to go out and harvest these things and eat them. So again, sometimes it's zero time. If it's a horticulture spray oil, there is no pre-harvest interval. But some things you have to wait a few days. So one issue that you could really have a problem with as homeowners, and it's sometimes uh, will catch you off guard, but you need to be aware of, is drift. Drift is when a product is, you're trying to apply it here, and it moves over here. Most of the time that's through wind action, but also it could be through, um, through heating and moving off as a vapor. So make sure that you are aware of drift and what causes it. Minimizing drift or avoiding drift is a key to safe pesticide usage at any level, regardless if it's organic or a synthetic product. So you really only want to spray what you intend to spray. One of the big keys about drift is um, the wind. Higher wind will cause the particles to, as you can imagine, blow off target. The higher the wind, the more likely it is. The uh, size of the droplets also will help drift. If, if it's a very fine particle of, of spray coming out, it will move much more easily with less wind, whereas large drops will fall much more with gravity straight down. So you want to adjust the particle size. With some applicators, you can adjust the nozzle to produce larger or smaller particles. So again, before you fill it with pesticide, go ahead and if you're testing the equipment, dial in the size of the particle you want. That would really help you out so that, that you know what you're going to be dealing with. See what kind of drift you would have with plain water before you go and add the insecticide. Some things you can do to reduce drift would be use hand sprayers or smaller equipment to get closer to the target. You could use cardboard shields to uh, block the beneficial the plants that you want to keep. And of course, spray on calm days with uh, low humidity if you can. The uh, humidity will help vaporize that and move off, and also the greater the wind, the more chance of drift. Very oftentimes the label will actually have precautions of wind and what uh, what wind speeds not to apply in. So they might say, do not apply in 10 mile an hour wind right there on the label. And that would really give you a clue. Some things that we see a lot of are damage to tomatoes and rose plants. They are very susceptible to herbicide damage. So a lot of times it comes in, people think they have a disease and it turns out that uh, no, it's just the, uh, the, <coughs> the herbicide that they use on the sidewalk blew over and, and came in contact with the tomato plant, and then you'll have these kind of problems. So what about these homemade pesticides that we see all over social media and the internet? I know we've all seen them. If you're anywhere online, um, there's a lot of recipes circulating using homemade products. Let's talk about a couple of the more common ones and why they do or do not work. One of the more common ones would be the homemade Roundup recipe. Um, this is intended to be used as an herbicide around the garden or maybe in your driveway, your sidewalk cracks, or along a fence line. And typically it includes some ratio of vinegar, salt, and dish soap dissolved into water. And this is one that I've seen a million times. And people tag me in it all the time and I'm just like, no! Horticultural vinegar is an herbicide and does work, but it's extremely concentrated. This is not the same vinegar that you get at the grocery store. Um, it's a lot more effective because it is a higher octane vinegar. Applying salt to your garden or your soil is never a good idea um, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, it kills the soil biology. Remember, we had talked about that in the soil lesson, how much of the soil is alive, and plants need that living system to really thrive. So anytime you salt your soil, that's not a good thing. That's actually an old-timey war tactic where they would salt the fields so that nothing would grow in the future. 
Um, this might be okay depending on the area. If you want to salt the earth on your sidewalk in the cracks and keep things from growing forever, go for it. If you're trying to control weeds in your vegetable garden, do not do this. Dish soap is also not labeled for use on plants. We see a lot of recipes that call for use of Dawn, and the thinking is like, oh, they use Dawn dish soap to clean up baby ducks and oil spills. It must be safe. Dish soap is not labeled for use in gardens. That's illegal. There is one exception, the Dr. Bronner's brand. It's like that organic Castile soap. That is actually labeled as a pesticide. And it's got a really long, weird label, but if you take the time to read it, that is actually labeled for use as a pesticide. So check it out. Um, a lot of dish soaps are also petroleum-based, so they, again, destroy soil biology. Does this homemade Roundup work? Sort of. I've tried it at my house a number of times. I know Dr. Strahan at LSU has also tried it. If you do a lot of YouTube searches, you'll see very mixed results. It does work on small broadleaf species, usually when they're under three inches tall. Um, they get knocked back. It burns them back. On grasses and larger weeds, not so much. It will never kill the root system. They just laugh at you. Two weeks later, they're back full force. And it ruins the ground in that location for planting for a very long time. So it's better to use a legal pesticide, a legal herbicide, to take care of that weed problem or get out there with your best herbicide control, your two hands. Get out there and pull some weeds. That's part of gardening, so there are no shortcuts. Sometimes it's best to just put in the work. Another recipe I see a lot is this homemade bug spray. And this is an interesting one. It's Epsom salt, dish soap, and cayenne pepper mixed up with water. Um, Epsom salts are not the same as table salt. They actually contain magnesium and they differ chemically from the table salt. So unless your plant is short on magnesium, you shouldn't really use Epsom salts in the garden. Um, if you do a quick Google search, you're gonna see a lot of people recommending Epsom salts for just about everything. It's not a cure-all, it's not a pesticide. Um, it can actually be detrimental to your plant health because magnesium, if you overapply it, can bind up a lot of other soil nutrients. So you end up causing a much larger problem in the long run. Dish soap is also very harmful to the waxy cuticle on the top of the leaves that protects it from UV light. So we get a lot of calls where people will use a dish soap based homemade pesticide on their plants and then that cuticle's gone so the plants actually burn up in the sun and sometimes die. Um, it's not good. So don't use dish soap on plants. You're gonna kind of break down their natural defenses and you risk doing a lot of harm. A better alternative to this recipe would be an insecticidal soap product. That's something that's organic and available at most of the garden centers, and it's specifically designed to be gentle on plants and provide those pest control benefits. So check it out. That's a good alternative. Don't forget to post your lab results to the discussion board. Again, the discussion board is optional. Here's the link one more time. Um, and then I think there's some threads going right now to see what everyone's up to in their gardens. We love clicking through those, so be sure to post there as well.